what is the gospel of the kingdom? Because we know it's found in scripture, and how does it differ from Paul's gospel? Um, there seems to be a consensus amongst a lot of Christians um, and professing Christians who think that um, that from the very beginning, going all the way back to even as far back as Adam and Eve, that everybody's been saved the same way. Um, that, you know, going into the Old Testament, <clears throat> people were, you know, believing in a future Messiah that would one day come and that he would bleed and die on the cross for their sins and be buried and raised again the third day. And that by, by believing that gospel, they could be saved by grace through faith alone. Um, by grace through faith, but um, <clears throat> I know what you mean. So is that true? Like did Noah and Abraham, like did Noah, did Noah one day, you know, maybe before, during, or even after he built the ark, um, which is what God told him he needed to do to be saved, um, was it just his faith alone? Did he, did he get down on his hands and knees and, and pray one day, you know, uh, what's up, Johnny? <laughs> Yeah, Sonny. Um, did he just get down on his knees and pray one day and say, I don't know your name, but there's... In fact, I don't even know the prophecies because they haven't even been recorded yet. But I just have this gut feeling that if I believe in a future Messiah um, to be named later, that he's going to die on a cross for my sins be buried and raised again the third day. I'm believing and trusting in him and what he's going to do on the cross for me for my salvation. Did Abraham, when God told him to offer his son Isaac on the altar um, to essentially demonstrate his faith in God, um, did he take Isaac up on the altar and then after, you know, God told him, nope, 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 stop. There's a, there's a ram over there that's going to be, you know, the sacrifice. And, and he said, okay, that's it. Wow. I don't have any prophetic writings yet. None of the prophet Israel doesn't even exist yet. They're going to come from my loins one day as my grandson Jacob um, will have his name changed and give birth to the 12 tribes of Israel and thereby come Moses who will then give them the, the law. Did he like see that ram and say, I know what this means. It means that I need to trust in the, the future um, death, burial and resurrection of this Messiah that hasn't been prophesied yet. Um, not sure what his name is or anything. But is that how, you know, is that what I need to do to say? So you get the point. But that's what people, when people say everybody's always been saved the same way, that's what they're saying. Now, if they're, if they're saying that, without understanding our gospel that saves today, then that's a bigger problem because they're probably not saved. There's one gospel today, and it's been this way for nearly 2,000 years that saves a person. And it was revealed to the Apostle Paul. It was a mystery that was kept secret since the world began that Paul preached Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and not according to prophecy like Peter and the... 12 and the prophets and everybody else did and he lays it out in 1 Corinthians 15 1 through 4 and a lot of you know this but I'm just making it clear 
that the gospel today, a Jew or a Gentile, if they believe 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again the third day and put their faith and trust in Christ alone, they're saved and they are baptized by one spirit and one body. The Holy Spirit baptizes them into the body of Christ where there is no Jew or Gentile. Okay, got it. And I want to point out that nobody will ever receive eternal life and live in the new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem, meaning not in the lake of fire, without the basis of their salvation being the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You know, if if Christ had never come and died on the cross and was resurrected, even if he died on the cross, if he never resurrected, he, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, if Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain, our preaching's in vain, you're yet in your sins. He had to be resurrected, okay? Um, so there is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. However, what was required of people during different periods and different times, the amount of information that they were given through progressive revelation, as well as the message that was being preached for salvation, the gospel for them or for us did change over time. Um, so that's what we're going to look at is what is the difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of Christ? Because they're different. Jesus taught and preached the gospel of the kingdom he did not preach to believe in his death, future death, burial, and resurrection for salvation. Nowhere will you find that anywhere in the Gospels. Okay, so... Didn't know you didn't know I guess. Sonny boys, I love you. Um, Twelve didn't know he had to die. No, uh, Sonny boy, that's a very good question, and we're going to take a look at that. And I'm going to prove from Scripture that they didn't preach the same gospel, okay? Um, so anyway, let's get into this. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm blind. All right, so here, here's how we know. I just told him he was going to die. Let's see. He would have to believe. He don't say they would have to believe he was going to Exactly. And that's the difference. A lot of, what a lot of people will do is they'll say, well, it was prophesied that the Messiah would come and he would suffer and die and be raised again. He did. It, it was prophesied. And in Acts 26, even Paul, when he's addressing the Jews who wanted him dead and they were going after him, he defended himself and said, look, I'm not preaching anything inconsistent with with the Old Testament scriptures at all. I'm saying I am preaching the death of Christ and his resurrection according to the scriptures, consistent with the scriptures. But nobody knew that that gospel that we believe, what what exactly was was going to happen with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and how does it pertain to um, to our salvation. That was a mystery that was not revealed to anybody until it was revealed um, to the Apostle Paul. So, so the 12 couldn't have, couldn't have been preaching another gospel. Um, and I'm just going to go through some verses here. Mark chapter 9, verse 30. If you don't have your Bible, at least jot down these references so you can go look at them later. Now again, this is during the earthly ministry of Christ with the Twelve. Now if there's anybody, if you think Abraham knew the gospel that we believe today, or Moses, or Noah, or Adam, or David, or any of them, you know, you need to look no further than to the 12 that walked with him, you know, 
for three years at least, um, you know, during his earthly ministry and were sent out by him, which we're going to look at, um, to preach the gospel. They did preach the gospel during his earthly ministry, just like John the Baptist and, <clears throat> and Jesus. Which if you look at, let me show you this first. Matthew 4, Matthew 4, 17, from that time forth, Jesus began, this is when he began his earthly ministry, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heavens at hand. The kingdom of heaven there is referring to the earthly millennial kingdom that was prophesied to Israel. Um, <clears throat> John the Baptist before him came on board and it says, let me see here. I didn't jot down these verses, references here. Um, If somebody can look it up and put it in the comments. John, oh, yeah. Three, Matthew 3, 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. It's the same thing. Annika, how are you? Um, it's the same thing. Repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. This was their message, and they were sent only to Israel. This was the message to Israel regarding their promised millennial kingdom. So John the Baptist was preaching that. Um, Jesus was preaching that. If you look at Matthew 10, this is after all 12 disciples are now chosen and walking with Christ during his earthly ministry. And he says in Matthew 10, verse 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. Now the names of the twelve, and he lists them. And it says in verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Matthew 15, 24, Jesus said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus is our Savior. He's our Lord. But his earthly ministry, and he died for the sins of everybody, but his earthly ministry was only to Israel. He talked about the Syrophoenician woman that came and showed faith, and he says, not me to give crumbs to the children's bread to the dogs and you know essentially was was referring to the fact that Israel is is his, the focus of his ministry he did not come to minister to the gentiles because he was offering the kingdom it was re the message was repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand and guess what the king is here okay Matthew 10:5 he says these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Which, again, he's telling them the same thing. He chose the twelve Jewish disciples. He said, go not in the way of the Gentiles. Matthew 15, 24, Jesus says, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay? So, Matthew 10, 5, or 10, 6, go not, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, what? The kingdom of heaven's at hand. Same thing that John the Baptist preached. Same thing that Jesus was preaching 
they were all preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The earthly millennial kingdom that was prophesied to Israel all throughout the Old Testament prophets, um, including, which we'll probably look at here in a minute, including back as far as it was um, essentially prophesied by Moses himself when he referred to the fact that they were going to be a kingdom of priests. So, so you get it? This is, this is how they started off their ministry. Um, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So, how do we know that that gospel of the kingdom was not believe that Jesus Christ will die soon for your sins and be buried and rose again believing on believe that gospel and be saved Mark 9 verse 30 this is this is towards the end of Christ's earthly ministry And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that many, that any man should know it, for he taught his disciples, okay, so now he's, he's teaching his disciples something after they've been out preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and says, the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him and after he is killed he shall rise the third day so what is he talking about there the death of Christ and his resurrection which is what we believe today to be saved we glory in the cross Paul talks about how we glory in the cross that is our good news that is our gospel that we must believe today to be saved so, so he tells them, hey, it's time for me to go die and be resurrected. And then what does the next verse say um, as far as how the disciples responded? Now, if they were preaching the gospel that was revealed to Paul, they would have said, finally, hallelujah, it's finally time for the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Christ, to go to Calvary and bleed and die on the cross for our sins. And we know three days later he'll rise again. That's not what they responded with. They says, but they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. There's no way that they had been preaching Paul's gospel from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that saves today they didn't understand when Jesus said that he was going to go go bleed and die look at Luke 18 verse 31 roughly the same time then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them behold we go up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the son of man shall be accomplished for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles he's talking he's referring to the prophecies about his death and resurrection with his disciples that he'd walked with for three years and sent them out preaching the gospel of the kingdom for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on and they shall scourge him and put him to death and the third day he shall rise again. And all the disciples said, Hallelujah! It's finally time, the salvation of the world through the Messiah. The same gospel that we've been preaching and that everybody from Adam all the way up to us have been looking forward to the cross for salvation because he's going to bleed and die on the cross for our sins and be resurrected as the Son of God. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, 
neither knew they the things which were spoken. So they still didn't understand. They still didn't know. And these things were hid from them. So hold that thought that they were hid from him, from them. After going out and being sent by Christ, walking with him for three years, and him sending them out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And here they are saying, he's like, okay, now it's time. I'm going to go bleed and die. Be raised again. They're like, what? What are you talking about? Like, they understood him not. There was no response that says, you know, we don't want to see you go through it. But hey, we know what you're going to do. We know the importance of it because we've been preaching and telling people to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection that is to come. No, they didn't understand it. Even though it was prophesied that the Messiah would one day die and be raised again the third day, that those, those two factions of the gospel were prophesied, but it was still a mystery hidden God as to what that signified and what that would accomplish. That three-day period in Jerusalem nearly 2,000 years ago that turned the world upside down, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Again, Matthew 16. This is one of the accounts that most people are familiar with. This is right after they had been sent out to preach. They'd been sent out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Like in Matthew 10, they were sent out. And he said, go not the way of the Gentiles and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. The earthly millennial kingdom to Israel. And after they came back, he asked him, they, they, and I'm going to just tell you right before where we're getting to. It's all in Matthew 16. But they're at the coast of Caesarea at Philippi. And the disciples come back from preaching this gospel of the kingdom to Israel. And that's when Jesus says, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? In other words, what are these people out here saying about me? Like, now that you've gone out preaching, you know, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand, and guess what? The king is here, the Christ, the Messiah, the prophesied one. Whom do men say that I, I the Son of Man, am? And they respond. Some say that you're Jeremiah, some Isaiah, some John the Baptist, or one of the prophets. And he says, but whom say ye that I am? Those are obviously all the wrong answers because he was none of them. But as they went out preaching and were shaking the dust off their feet and going to the next town and shaking the dust off their feet and going to the next town because they kept getting rejected over and over and over again. And he says, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter steps forth and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjonas, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. The greatest faction and component of the gospel of the kingdom is to believe, Israel needed to believe, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And it's repeated all throughout in the gospels that that was a requirement. They had to believe he was who he says, who he said that he was. And that he was, he was the prophesied promised Messiah and the Son of God. So after, after that exchange back and forth, I mean, Peter, blessed art thou, Simon Barjonas, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And he, you know, then he crowns him as Pope, according to the Catholics. Um, when he says, you know, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then right after that, Pope Peter, newly appointed Pope Peter says, um, let's see, 
From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. That's the gospel. So right after this high moment of Peter acknowledging and declaring that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, he tells them, it's time for me to fulfill the death, burial, and resurrection that was prophesied. And Peter's response, Pope Peter says, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, rebuking Christ himself to his face, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Pope Peter was trying to keep Jesus Christ from going to the cross and dying and being buried and raised again the third day so that we could be saved by grace through faith by believing that gospel and putting our faith and trust in Christ. And he just rebukes him to the face and says, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, he said to Pope Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. <clears throat> so, right after acknowledging that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, he immediately tells them that, that he must go to the cross, that he must go die and be raised again the third day. Peter rebukes him. And then Jesus comes right back and tells Pope Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. But they were preaching the same gospel, right? They were preaching Paul's gospel to believe that Jesus was going to die on the cross for our sins to be buried and rose again. That was the good news, right? That was the good news to Israel. I mean, it's not even a possibility based on scripture, not based on, you know, churchianity that teaches, you know, oh yeah, everybody in the Old Testament was looking forward to the cross. Everybody, now we look back to the cross. You won't find that anywhere in God's word at all. And it couldn't be more clear that all the way up to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, his own 12 disciples that had been preaching the gospel of the kingdom to Israel had no clue, no understanding whatsoever. So, the little stones. Da uh -huh. So, um, that's funny. Okay. <clears throat> so right here and then actually right before right before the whole back and forth <laughs> make sure to strike me um, right before he rebukes Peter he instructed the disciples then charged to his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. That is red letters that nobody follows today, obviously. And nobody follows the red letters where he tells his disciples, go not in the way of the Gentiles. Because hopefully you're going to Gentiles and telling them that Jesus is the Christ and preaching the gospel to them. So why was it a secret why was it being hid like what was the whole point of of their not understanding like why didn't Jesus the very first day when he called them from their fishing why did not why did why did Jesus not just tell them the very first day Guess what? I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm going to bleed and die on the cross for your sins and be buried and rose again on the third day. Believe that gospel and trust in me and you'll be saved. 
there's a whole bigger plan and purpose that has been going on since the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3.15, it's the first prophecy of the Messiah, how that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the seed of the serpent and he shall bruise his heel. That was the first prophecy of the Messiah. And Satan knew that that coming seed was going to be his destruction ultimately. So he tried to destroy that seed. And then when Israel became a nation and then Judah was born and it was, it was going to come from the tribe of Judah, you know, it was, it was all the way up the time of the birth, trying to kill the firstborn, you know, or all the babies under, under two years old in Bethlehem and all that stuff. It was a constant effort by Satan and by those under his influence and control to destroy the seed, which is Christ, which Paul talks about in Galatians. But so essentially, um, you know, uh, you know, Satan, Satan wanted as op, as opposed to Peter and the disciples didn't want Jesus to die. Satan did want him to die and he entered into Judas to betray him so that he would be arrested and ultimately crucified. That's what Satan wanted. But guess what? Um, He had no idea what was going to happen. He didn't know that that was how he was going to bruise his head and destroy Satan and get victory over death, hell, and the grave. And we know that because in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul writes, But we, howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. So we're talking about the princes of the world and, of course, the prince of the power of the air is Satan. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. That's what mystery is. It's hidden wisdom in God that is then later revealed to somebody at a specific time according to God's timeline which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So what it's saying there, Paul's explaining that this mystery that had been hid in God and not revealed until the Apostle Paul, that had they known... And had Satan known that the greatest three days ever was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that it would also be to the demise of of Satan and have him become the victor over death because Satan was, um, you know, Satan basically had dominion over death and everything. Had they known it, they would not have crucified him. So it was like the old switcheroo. All those thousands of years, it was kept secret from the princes of the world, including Satan, of what was going to happen and the and the the outcome of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So it was kept secret. For had they known it, they would not have crucified him. So rather than Satan coming in and possessing Judas to betray him so that he was killed, he would have prevented Jesus from dying on the cross. So it, it's a completely um, is it lagging? Or is that just you, Jake? Okay. So that's why when you see um, in Romans 16, 25, that's why Paul says, 
speaking of that mystery in the gospel that was revealed to him, which he clarifies in Galatians 1, 11, and 12, that he received his gospel, not of men or of angels or anybody, that he received it by revelation from Jesus Christ himself, the resurrected Christ returned and gave him the revelation of the mysteries. Um, and so he says in Romans sixteen twenty five, he says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, not that he's the Savior, he's just my gospel, the gospel that was revealed to me specifically, um, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, not according to prophecy, but according to the revelation of the mystery. Because according to prophecy, it was just prophesied that a Messiah would come and die and be raised again. But he preached Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. It had never been revealed prior to the Apostle Paul. And you can see why it was all part of God's plan, but it was kept secret until after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and ascension of Christ. And then he returned to the Apostle Paul and revealed to him, here's the gospel that I want you to preach to beginning with the Jew and then on to the Gentiles. He was chosen as the Apostle to the Gentiles, Romans eleven thirteen. But when he would go into these Gentile nations and cities, he would always start off in the Jewish synagogue and they would reject him and he'd go out to the Gentiles and preach the gospel and they'd get saved and they would believe um, until finally later on in Acts 28 he finally just shakes his shakes the dust off and says that's it, salvation's fully gone to the Gentiles the Jews had you know, rejected him and fallen and and then eventually God destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. And now we live in this dispensation of grace. Um, but I want to just share some things also um, in regards to this gospel of the kingdom that like I said the content of it was fundamentally you had to believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of God that's what Israel needed to believe as as the the very foundation of the gospel of the kingdom and um, you know he he uh, has specific components that are tied in directly with um, with the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom, like I said, is the earthly millennial kingdom. And if you look in, you go all the way back as far as Exodus 19 and Moses even says in Exodus 19, 6, that he's speaking to Israel and he says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded, commanded him. So as far back as Moses, he's telling the children of Israel that you're going to be a kingdom of priests. Okay? During this period of time, you have the Aaronic priesthood that had specifics of going into um, of going into the priesthood there were requirements for them and I'm gonna fast I'm, I'm gonna cover a couple things here in Exodus 29 and then we're gonna jump to John the Baptist and it'll make sense about the gospel of the kingdom and why they were doing things that they were doing, such as water baptism and so forth. So it, he's explaining the qualifications of the priesthood, which actually, let me just read one real quick from Leviticus twenty-one sixteen. I think it is. 
This was a, re a requirement. They had to be a physical specimen. That was a requirement. He says, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generation that hath any, any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame. He shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose or anything superfluous. Um, or a man that is broken footed or broken handed or crook backed or a dwarf or that hath a blemish in his eye or be scurvy or scab or hath his bones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest, shall come nigh to offer sacrifice unto the Lord. And then he goes on, Only he shall not go in un unto the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries, for I, the Lord, do sanctify them. And Moses told it unto Aaron and his sons and unto the children of Israel. So he was established in the fact but these, these priests had to be a physical specimen. So when you look ahead, remember that for the gospel of the kingdom. They had to be a physical specimen. They couldn't have anything, blind, lame, any of these things. And then I'm just going to hit this, and then we'll jump to, to uh, back to the New Testament, or back to the gospels. So here was the process of the priesthood. They had to be a physical specimen, no blemishes. Is Exodus 29, 1. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them that, to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. So he's, he's, he's getting these people that are qualified to become priests. Those that were physical specimens. And the first thing is in verse 4. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shalt wash them with water. Jews refer to that as baptisms. The doctrine of baptisms in Hebrews chapter 6, like verse 2 or 3, it talks about the doctrine of baptisms. That's what it's talking about, the washings for the priesthood. So remember that, the washings of the water. Verse 7 then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. So anoint them with oil. Washings, baptism by water, anointing with oil. And then in, from verses 10, pretty much through like at least verse 25, it's... Laying, it's giving specifics about it starts off with a bullock and how they have to put the priests have to put their hands on it when they slaughter them and then they have to put the blood on their ear and then on their right big toe and their um, their right thumb and all these other things but ultimately in verse 21 it says and thou shalt take the blood that is upon the altar I think that's of the rams thou shalt take the blood that is upon the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons upon the garments of his son and he shall be hallowed and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him so you've got the water baptisms the washing of water the anointing with oil and then you've got the sprinkling of blood okay and they had to be a physical specimen and as Moses said you're going to be a kingdom of priests and holy nation and actually, I'll just throw it in. That was Exodus 19, 6, where he said that. And in verse 5, I think is where it says, And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose, choose us out, man, and go out. Oops, that's a different one. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep, keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation anybody that studies their bible 
much at all, that probably rings a bell from the New Testament in 1 Peter. And I know I'm kind of bouncing around here, but I'm trying to get paint the whole picture here. Peter wasn't talking to you either. He was writing to the Jews that were scattered abroad and strangers in Gentile nations. And he says in 1 Peter 2, I think. Does anybody know where it is? Hey, no. Hold on, let me grab it. First Peter 2, 9. I thought I, thought I looked right at it. Yeah, talking to Israel. Now that's the baptism one, Johnny. First Peter 2, 9. Let me just read Exodus again. Now, therefore, if you, they will, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you, sh you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a an holy nation. 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what Peter's talking about there. We as members of the body of Christ are not a royal priesthood. We are not an holy nation. We're not a chosen generation. That's what Peter's referring to there. He's addressing Israel and preaching that gospel of the circumcision that they're going into their kingdom. So now let's go to the gospels. What in this world is this John the Baptist guy doing? <clears throat> And I won't go into it, but if you go to the end of Malachi, it pretty much leaves off with um, it pretty much it leaves off the end of Malachi talking about the the prophecy of John the Baptist, a voice of one crying in the wilderness will be coming onto the scene. Fast forward 400 years of, after 400 years of silence, John the Baptist and Jesus are born and, and come onto the scene. And I'll point this out. One of the other things that was a requirement of the Levitical priesthood was they had to be between the ages of 30 and 50. Guess how old John the Baptist and Jesus were? John the Baptist was like six months older than Jesus. Guess how old they were when they began their public ministries? 30. So they were, they were already qualified as priests by the fact that they were, yep, by the fact that they were of, um, they were, they were of Israel. They were 30. They were physical specimens. So what's the next step? We know that Christ was became the 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 high priest after the order of Melchizedek, but what was what was the very first thing that they did? The first thing they did at Exodus was bingo, Meg's water baptism. They were not picturing the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. This was in, re in regards to um, the priesthood and preparing them, the kingdom of heavens at hand. You're going to be a, nation, a kingdom of priests. You're going into this kingdom 
And so the, it began with the water baptism and they were only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, preparing them to go into that kingdom. So it began with the water baptism. And then what was the second thing? The anointing with oil. Well, we know from, um, I think it's, I think it's also in first Peter where it talks about the anointing of the Holy spirit and, and everything. And we know that when Jesus was baptized, you know, John the Baptist spoke and said, I baptize with water, but there's coming one after me. He will baptize you with the Holy ghost and with fire. You don't want the baptism with fire. That's judgment. So at Pentecost, that was when that anointing aspect of it was done, when he poured out his spirit, poured out the Holy Ghost on the men of Israel that day, um, which is different than the one baptism that saves today that Paul talks about in Ephesians 4, 5, and he says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That one baptism is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, and 13, where Paul talks about we're baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Pentecost was not that. That was not had nothing to do with the Holy Spirit baptizing people into the body of Christ. That was the fulfillment of Jesus said that, or John the Baptist said, Jesus will baptize with the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said, when I leave, I'm going to send a comforter. That was, that was the anointing um, with oil so to speak, the anointing of the, the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, the third thing was the sprinkling of the blood, which Christ fulfilled that um, on Calvary. So, the, you know, the, the gospel of the kingdom was about Israel going into their kingdom it was factually known in scripture. Um, um, you know, these people were, were getting prepared to go into the kingdom. So then you've got, um, and I'm, I'm going to have to go off memory here. So we know that water baptism is is tied in with the gospel of the kingdom. They had to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. They, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sonny Boy cracks me up. Um, Luke 7, I believe. I wish I'd written these down. Okay, so you got Matt, or Luke 8. I think it's Luke 9 that I'm looking for. Luke 8, you've got where Jesus comes in preaching the gospel of the kingdom and he begins healing people. Luke 9. Yeah, Luke 9, 1. And he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And you've got in the same thing, 
almost every time that it talks about them preaching the gospel of the kingdom, it's tied directly in with healing, physical healing. Which, again, that was the whole point of giving them the gift of healing was to be able to take these people that were lame and blind and everything else and to make them into physical specimens to to fix and heal and resolve them of whatever it was that was that was preventing them from qualifying to be priests in the kingdom of priests that they're going into um same thing with uh Well, there's multiple places. I think Luke 4 is another one. and I mean, I'm sure there's there, there's actually several times in the Gospels it, talk, it says, preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom, healing all manner of sickness. Like, so you got, you know, physical healing tied in with the Gospel of the Kingdom along with water baptism and the declaration that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Then, even as late as Mark 16, which, you know, Christians love the Great Commission. That was for that was for the church. We're supposed to go into all the world and uh, teach all nations, baptizing them, water baptizing them, and the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to keep the law like Jesus commanded them. Every all things whatsoever he commanded. Um, they love that one, you know. And I'm not again. I'm not saying we should not. Paul talks about that we're you know, ambassadors and that we have the ministry of reconciling. We're supposed to preach the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for his power of God and salvation. But that's Paul's gospel and we are to preach it. But the parallel passage to the Great Commission in Mark 16 is not too popular amongst evangelicals <clears throat> or Reformed or anybody else um, other than Pentecostals and Church of Christ and Catholics to some extent even though they don't preach the gospel, but where he says, uh, right after Jesus upbraids the, the 12, he says, and he said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Man, that's great. Go into the whole world and preach that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. Paul's gospel, which by the way, Paul hadn't been saved yet. That didn't happen until Acts 9 which means that the revelation of the mystery, the gospel um, that was revealed to Paul that was kept secret since the world began hadn't been revealed yet. And we've already shown how the disciples were clueless. Even in, let me show you this real quick and then I'll come back to this. John 20 verse nine, this is after the resurrection. I mean, surely after the resurrection, like the light bulb came on and the disciples were like, Oh yeah, I remember reading about when Noah and Abraham and and Adam and Eve believed in the de- future, looked forward to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You know, wink, wink. But in twenty nine, it says, uh, "This is after the resurrection." It says, "For as yet." they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. So even after the resurrection, it just says that they didn't, well, it says, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And then it says they just went home. All the disciples were like, oh man this really stinks you know Jesus died and and so they just went home you know because they didn't they did not preach Paul's gospel they didn't have a clue they didn't even believe that he had resurrected from the dead and then Mary ends up being the first one um, right after that to go find out but right after the he says go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature which, you know, I'm for that, but that's not what this is talking about. It's talking about, you know, about them going out preaching the gospel of the kingdom. If they'd been preaching, um, which now included the resurrection, and he says, um, 
he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Same thing with Peter preaching to Israel at Pentecost before the body of Christ. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. All who believe. All who believe. Um, will have these signs follow them. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. Same thing. S still preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Along with healing. And the reason why they're talking about... Um, the... Uh, Casting out of devils is the same thing. There's there's not going to be, you know, there aren't going to be demon-possessed people in the kingdom. In fact, during the millennial kingdom, Satan himself is going to be cast into the bottomless pit for the thousand years. So it's all preparation for that kingdom that is promised to Israel will be fulfilled. They will have a literal thousand year earthly kingdom at the second coming, it begins at the second coming of Christ when he rules and reigns from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Um, okay. And I'm going to finish up with one thing. I agree, Sonny Boy. I'm going to finish up with this one thing. So after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and ascension of Jesus, which, by the way, Acts 1, right before the ascension of Jesus, um, he says, he, you know, he's meeting with the disciples and... Um, showed himself alive, but many infallible proofs, uh, being seen in them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Um, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart, that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Salvation had to come to Jerusalem first because Israel was, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed through Israel in the millennial kingdom. They needed to get, they needed is that it started with Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and the outermost parts of the world. They never succeeded even, even getting out of Jerusalem with this gospel of the kingdom because they were rejected by the, the Jewish leaders. But wait for the promise of the Father which saith he have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So they've had the water baptism, John's baptism, and then he's saying that they'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence, which we know is coming right up. And when they therefore were come together, this is what the disciples asked Jesus right before his ascension. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They're still waiting for that kingdom, and they're asking Jesus before his ascension, now is it going to happen? We've been preaching this thing for the past three years, and, you know, you've, you've now uh, fulfilled the law and the prophets, you know, of the things that, that were pertaining to your earthly life. And it's like, they're ready to go into the kingdom because Israel still had not completely fallen yet and they were getting ready to go into Daniel's 70th week, which is the last days, which is what Hebrews through Revelations focuses on. And he said unto them, it is not for you. He didn't say, 
yeah, the kingdom's here. You know, I'm going to go ascend, but I'll be right back. And then I'm going to bring you right into that kingdom we've been preaching about and preparing people through water baptism and healing and everything else. And he says, it is not for you to know the times of the seasons, which the father hath put in his own power. In other words, it's none of your business. It's not for you to know because it's, you know, he knows that it's, that it's, that it's not going to, um, that they're not going to go into that kingdom anytime soon. And he's basically, you know, telling them it's none of your business, you know, do what I tell you to <laughs> go, go, go out and, and, and preach this gospel of kingdom and keep at it and don't worry about when the kingdom's going to come in. So then you get to this, this last thing I'm going to, that I'm going to talk about is, um, Acts to Pentecost, where people think that the church began. Meaning, the church, the body of Christ. There's a church in the wilderness. There's a church in Jerusalem. Um, you know, you call it the kingdom church, whatever. Church just means, you know, ecclesia is called out assembly. But the church, the body of Christ, was a mystery revealed to Paul. And Peter's going to the men of Israel in Jerusalem in Pentecost. And he starts off, you know, ye men of Israel. And he's like, tells them, you know, this Jesus hath God raised up. Uh where we're all witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God. Uh, let me see. Okay, so this is this is still before the revelation of the mystery, the gospel revealed to Paul. Like I said earlier, Paul glorified or gloried in the cross, and we glory in the cross today. That's why Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. But in Acts 2, 36, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he's preaching there's a reference up to the the crucifixion there but it's not good news he's not preaching and saying you know it doesn't say uh therefore let all the house of israel know surely that god hath made this same jesus lord and christ because you did exactly what god wanted you to do or depending on how you look at it, what Satan wanted you to do and crucify, which it was. It was it was still hidden God. So essentially, at this point in time, it would have been you did Satan's bidding and you crucified him. This is a murder indictment against Israel. This is not good news. He's not preaching the good news of the cross to them. He's he's giving a murder indictment to these men of Israel. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked at their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're pricked at the heart because they were just, Peter was up there preaching, saying, you just crucified the Messiah, the same Jesus. You sent, you crucified him. And they were pricked at the heart and said, what shall we do? So then how does Peter respond? Well, what you need to do is you need to believe that Christ died for your sins and that he was buried and he rose again the third day and put your faith and trust in Christ alone. Said, no, that's not what he says. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Same thing. Repent. Get baptized. 
The only difference now, it says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, as many as the Lord. And then he goes on at this church that is called a church, but they met in the temple, which should tell you something. You know, this is still strictly Jews and Gentile proselytes, and he tells them that same group of people, sell everything you have, throw it all together in a big, you know, welfare system, and every man will have what he needs and everything. That was part of the kingdom. That's what was told even beforehand, you know, sell everything you have. Why would you sell everything you have? Because you're getting ready to go into a kingdom where all your needs are provided for you. You don't need anything. You don't need money. You won't have to work for food. It'll all be provided for you, which is part of the kingdom as far as, you know, one of the promises of the kingdom. Yeah, but it but it's still, it's the same gospel, right? So, sorry, I said that was going to be the last thing. This, this is the last thing. I'm just going to read this real quickly, and then I'm going to see if you guys have questions or if somebody wants to jump in the guest box and talk. So Acts 3, same thing. Peter goes to a temple and he's preaching at the temple. And he tells these people, um, but ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murder to be granted unto you. Barabbas. Um, and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. He's still, you know, coming at these, at these, at these Jews and saying, you killed him. And he says, in his name, through faith in his name, which that was a big part of the program for Israel as well, was the name the next chapter, he says, there's no other name under heaven given among them whereby, whereby we must be saved, Jesus. Because they needed to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. Whom we see and know, yea, the faith which is by him again. Verse 17, and now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance you did it, that you crucified him through ignorance. As did your rulers, which was true. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 16 said, tell no man that I am the Christ from this day forward. Because if they did not know who he was, then it's only manslaughter versus murder. And so that's why he was able to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do because he was hiding it all from them. But they were still, you know, were guilty of killing him and everything. And it says... But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's talking about the second coming. That's when Israel's sins will corporately be blotted out and forgiven. We believe the gospel today and our sins are all forgiven past, present, and future. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution. I'm talking about the kingdom. Times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Peter's still preaching Christ according to prophecy, not according to the revelation of the mystery, like Paul says in Romans 16 and 25, when he says, Now to him there is a power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Peter's preaching him according to prophecy, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Peter's message and the twelve and even Jesus, John, they were preaching Christ according to prophecy that had been spoken of by the prophets since the world began. Paul comes on and he's preaching a gospel that was kept secret since the world began, which is why we talked about that earlier as far as why it had to be kept a secret. 
you know, especially from Satan himself. 